So welcome. And the topic today is to look at methods which uh, don't sound that exciting. Actually, optimization is a kind of neglected field in uh, physics and et cetera, et cetera, but it actually plays a central role in fields like machine learning. It's actually at the heart of basically all machine learning algorithms. And in our case, with the Monte Carlo calculation, it's gonna serve the purpose that we can avoid wasting tons of cycles on parameters, which lead us away from the minimum. So we can use these gradients to actually find the optimal values or the parameters we need in order to run a large scale calculation. So many of you have taken courses on machine learning, and that means that you may have seen many of these quantities and these topics before. So for some of you, this may be a little bit boring, but I hope not, because we are going to link that with the Monte Carlo calculations. But basically, the uh, kind of calculations which we will end up doing and the motivation for why we select specific methods is something which I hope I can convey to you. At the end, the kind of method which is the preferred one is actually something as simple as what is called gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent, which many of you have encountered before, especially if you have many parameters. Now, in uh, this specific project, which we have, in, in the project which we have, we have very few parameters to optimize, which means that the, the case which we need to look at in terms of optimizations is pretty simple. So for project one, there is essentially on, only one variational parameter. For those of you who would like to move into systems of interacting fermions, or if you wish to do the machine learning variant of project number two using the same system, then you're going to end up with many, many more parameters. So what we are going to do now in essentially from an optimization point of view is what people may uh, in a kind of uh, so half choking the way, say, call just a baby case, right? And so the optimization part is going to be pretty simple. Now, there's a reason why uh, you will see we don't calculate the second derivative of the energy because the second derivative, when we run Monte Carlo calculations, is going to involve seven integrals which have to be evaluated stochastically. So the second derivative plays a central role in the uh, estimation of the curvature of the function which we want to evaluate. Uh, we are also going to have a situation which makes life very simple because the second derivative, which we have from a quantum mechanical system is going to be proportional with the variance. The variance is always larger than zero or equal to zero. So that means that we have a convex problem. So the energy uh, variation, which we will do is actually what we normally call a benign problem, a well-defined problem with a convex function. So we know that there is a minimum. And that means that uh, we can actually uh, use simpler methods. And what will surprise you also is that basically all the methods which you may encounter in optimization theory, in particular convex optimization theory, which is a kind of standard or an optimization approach you will encounter in mathematics courses. The uh, kind of uh, method, the basic method, is a 400-old method, which is called Newton's method. And you will be surprised to see that this is actually the basis for many of the things which we do. So what I'm going to do now is to quickly remind you a little bit of what we did uh, before we had the lab uh, last week, the kind of equations which we need to program. And then we are going to go back to the mathematics of uh, the methods which we need to implement and why we end up implementing one of the simpler ones, which is like a gradient descent or gradient descent with momentum. So how many of you have heard or have actually studied optimization problems? Yeah, so those of you who have taken FIS SDK, you have encountered these things, but now I'm just gonna put them in a context of uh, the optimization of uh, the energy. So keep in mind that what we are evaluating are integrals and they are evaluated stochastically. 
which means that when we calculate the derivatives, we have a source of errors because we cannot evaluate these integrals with an infinity of Monte Carlo cycles. So that's gonna be something which is less controllable and often in this optimization process is something which is done in a little bit more sloppy way because you don't want to evaluate these integrals with too many cycles. So that means that if you rerun the calculations, you may find slightly different optimal parameters. So what many people do is actually to rerun the optimization several times and then take the average of the parameters which one gets and the average of the energies. So this is often a common strategy because we are evaluating integral stochastically. So that's the, uh, in our case, the optimization method is going to be simple, but our method is going to depend on the quality or the quality of the results will depend on the way we evaluate the integrals. And that's going to be the bottleneck, both from the computational point of view and if you think of the quality of your results. So that's just something to keep in mind here. So I just wanted to quickly let's go through uh, some of the things which we did uh, two weeks ago. And in that case, uh, I'm just bringing back these slides. And in these slides, there was a simple example, uh, which is pretty similar to what you're seeing in the project. And in the project, if you're looking at the one particle in one dimension with no interactions, with no more than one particle, then the trial wave function is given by this uh, ansatz here. You can then calculate, in this specific case, the uh, expectation value of the energy is just to integrate harmonic oscillator, and this is the local energy. And then you have an analytical expression. This means that when you take the derivative of the energy as a function of this variational parameter, there is a minimum when this quantity is equal to zero. Now, alpha can be, uh, can take negative and positive values, but normally it takes positive values. And it's a quantity which is assumed to be larger than zero, which means that we won't have a problem with the divisions by zero. We can calculate the second derivative and then you will see that the second derivative, since alpha is now comes in as a, as a to the power of the fourth, it means that this is a positive quantity. So this is a convex problem, which we have. So the energy is a convex function as a function of this parameter alpha. And you can see that when you plot this function. So the um, <coughs> when you take the derivative, you find that alpha is equal to one. As you've been seeing in your project, when you use this uh, trial wave function, which you have here. If you add more particle, the trial wave function with no interaction is simply the product of these wave functions. And when you then optimize the equations, the only difference between one and many is that there's gonna be a factor n, which reflects the number of particles you have. Because the total energy is just the sum of the single particle energies. Any questions so far? So uh, the thing which is nice with the harmonic oscillator is that the equations we get for the energies are pretty simple. And it means also that we, when we develop the code, we have benchmarks or calculations. We can always compare the code we develop with. And uh, you can then also calculate the variance for this specific case. And you will see that the variance is a quantity which is positive or larger than zero, equal, it's positive uh, or zero, <coughs> sorry. So the uh, quantity which you need to evaluate at the end in the program is this, this uh, bar here stands for this first derivative with respect to alpha. This is the first derivative of the wave function, which we rewrote in terms. So this quantity divided by that one is a derivative of the log of the wave function. And that gives a more compact equation and more practical equation since the trial wave function is often given by an exponential. So when you take the log of that one, that has a very simple expression. And to calculate the derivative of that expression is pretty simple. So you have uh, easy uh, terms to evaluate. And 
uh, you need now to evaluate this specific integral, and you also need to evaluate this integral and this integral. So when you calculate the energy, we obviously have a uh, standard error, but now we are going to have an error here, and we also have an error in the evaluation of that integral. So that means that when you calculate this gradient, this is something where we are going to neglect the statistical error when we evaluate these gradients. So we are just going to evaluate this with a given number of Monte Carlo cycles without caring too much about the statistical error in the evaluation of the integrals. And when you then find the optimal values, that's where you start your big Monte Carlo calculation in order to gain as much statistics as possible. So next week, we are going to look at how we can compute the standard deviation from the data which we have. And that's going to lead to something which, are, something which is called resampling techniques. And for these large data sets, which you will produce, because you're going to run millions of calculations, there is a method which is actually called the blocking method, which we are going to look at and implement in order to evaluate the best possible value of the standard deviation. Because when you calculate a quantity like the energy, you have always to provide an error estimate. And since you're running things with a Monte Carlo method, then you're producing statistical expectation values, expectation values, and that means that you also need to provide a standard deviation. And this is something we will discuss next week in more detail. And with those elements, we are going to have something which you can call uh, close to a professional Monte Carlo code for studying many body systems. So this was the general equation for the derivative. And in the, in the code, which we had here, we had a, a function where we evaluated the uh, energy and these additional integrals and calculated the derivative and actually implemented the gradient descent method, which we are going to derive today. Does that sound okay? So uh, last time I gave you the kind of program which you actually need to implement. And then when you have implemented this, uh, that's when you will find the optimal parameters. And with the optimal parameters, you can then actually produce these uh, estimates of the energy. There is something which is called Broidman's algorithm, which I will sketch to you today, which is a kind of, a, it's called a quasi-Newton method, where you actually try to not evaluate the second derivative, but you approximate it in the beginning, and then you try to approximate derivatives in subsequent steps. So if you are going to calculate the second derivative of this function here, of this, not this one, but the energy which you have, in this specific case, the simple case, it's just given by this function. So you, there's no problem in doing that. But in general, if you don't know the analytical answer or you don't you cannot calculate it, it's a, an integral which uh, involves Actually, it's an expectation value, which involves seven integrals. And if you're worried about having errors in the calculation of three integrals, you could start to worry even more if you want to calculate seven integrals and calculate the second derivative. Okay, so we are not going to calculate the second derivative, period. So let me give you some of the mathematics behind what is coming now. And you will find a lot of it in the slides here for this week. And there is a, a reminder of Newton's method, which I'm going to do in the, on the whiteboard here, if that's okay with everybody. But just to break the monotony, instead of just showing slides, I'm going to run through the whiteboard here. And we are going to meet uh, methods which will allow us to run the calculations in an efficient way without having to worry about the second derivative. And so let me just bring back the, uh, the whiteboard. Oops. Okay, everybody can, you can see well, guys. So the kind of function which we now want to evaluate is the energy at an optimal value. 
So let's suppose now that we just have one variable. So we have an one variational parameter. No, not that one. So this is just a, in uh, the term alpha, this is a one dimensional problem. And we have the optimal value, which is at the energy minimum. And I'm going to label this one as an alpha. So what we have then, if we now look at this problem, which is pretty close to what we are doing in project one, because we have only one variational parameter and that resides in the harmonic oscillator function. So we have an energy. So this is the expectation value of the energy. And I'm gonna use this uh, more physicist-like notation for the expectation value. And this is as a function of alpha. And for the harmonic oscillator, it's gonna look like this. And then we have an optimal parameter alpha hat here. So this is the parameter which we want to find by using a gradient method. So what we are doing now is to make, so I'm going to be a little bit more sloppy with notation. So I'm just simply going to change this one to a function which depends on alpha. So instead of using this expectation value, we're not now just gonna look at a function. And then we just tailor expand around the optimal value. alpha hat. So that means that we have E of alpha hat. And we are going to expand around the value which we have pre-calculated. So this pre-calculated value is a value which I'm going to call alpha of n, because later I'm going to link this with iterations. These type of problems are normally solved iteratively. So that means that I'm going to have a Taylor expansion around this quantity. So it's the energy evaluated at this value alpha n. And then I have the derivative of the energy. So I have alpha hat minus alpha of n. And this is multiplied with the derivative of the energy of d alpha at the value alpha n. And then I have obviously the second derivative. So what I get then is alpha hat minus alpha of n squared, and then I have the second derivative. And this is also evaluated at this alpha of n. And then I have higher order terms in alpha hat minus alpha of n. So I'm making a Taylor expansion around alpha minus alpha of n. I guess this doesn't look very complicated, hopefully not. So this is something which uh, we now can, uh, what we can do next is to assume that we can skip higher order terms. So we keep only the terms to uh, uh, second order. So we are going to approximate this now with an equation which looks like E of alpha of N plus this alpha minus alpha of N plus this term, oh, sorry, of D. Ah. And now I'm gonna skip the, the, the value alpha of N. So this derivative is evaluated at alpha of N plus the term, which is proportional with the second derivative of D alpha. So in principle, this should be an approximation, but I'm gonna skip that. Now, what we know then uh, is that if we look at this equation here, what we want is an equation where the uh, second derivative is actually, no, the first derivative is equal to zero. So what we want is something which is DE of this alpha of D alpha, equal to zero. Now, the first term is just a constant. So that means that disappears. And when we take the next term, 
we see there, then that we get <coughs> a term, which will uh, uh, depend obviously on these quantities. We've, what we can do now is we can simplify these calculations. So in, instead of carrying with us all these terms, we are going to simplify things so that this E of alpha is now just going to be replaced by a simple function f of x. So what we have now is a function f of x, which is equal to a constant plus uh, the derivative, which I'm going to replace with uh, just a df d of x. And this is multiplied with uh, a quantity, which I'm going to call a, uh, let me just rewrite it. Uh, let me rewrite it in a slightly different way. So it's going to contain x, which is the parameter we are performing the expansion around. And then I have my df dx plus, and then I have a factor, with, and it's common to put a factor of a half, x squared, because I actually forgot that one here. So we should have divided by 2. And this is divided by 2 here of x squared multiplied with this d of f of dx squared. So when I'm now calculating the derivative, and I want this function to be uh, equal to 0, so when I take df of d of x, and I want this to be 0, what that leads to is c is just a constant. And then I have this x, uh, which then disappears. So I have uh, the df dx. So I'm assuming now. And remember now that these functions, which you see here, they have now been evaluated at a specific value. So these are just constants, okay? If you look at the equations up here, this term here is evaluated at a specific value. So that's just a constant. And the same thing with this function here is just a constant, okay? So because I performed the Taylor expansion, and now I'm taking the derivative with respect to this optimal parameter, which in principle means that they have a function df of x here. And so that means that these functions, which you see here, they have been evaluated at a specific value. So these are constants. So when you then take the derivative with respect to x, you have x dependence here and the x dependence here. So that means that what I get then is the following expression. So I get that this term x, when I now rewrite everything, so x is going to be equal to minus this df d of x divided by df of dx, second derivative. Now you can generalize this now to more than just one parameter alpha. And in that specific case, the quantities which we get, they become for this first derivative, we are going to have a gradient. And for the second derivative, we will have a Jacobi matrix, which then will contain the expressions for the derivatives of the energy with respect to the variational parameters. So if we have more, if we have more, if we have more than one parameter, more than one alpha, then this parameter or this df dx, that is replaced by the gradient with respect to x or f. And this uh, second derivative, df dx second derivative is going to be replaced by a matrix, which is called the Hessian matrix. And this matrix is going to have matrix elements, uh, h, i, j, which are going to be given by the derivatives with respect to parameters xi and dxj. So now I'm having more than just one parameter. So that means that the function is function f of x, which we have here, and where x now uh, moves away from being just one single parameter, but x becomes a vector, which contains all the parameters we have. This is something which we can rewrite again as a constant. And now I have a G, which is a gradient. So I'm gonna call this function here for just G. 
So since this is a vector and everything here, which we end up with is a scalar, so I have G transposed times X, that becomes an inner product, just a scalar. And I can rewrite this in terms of a matrix plus one half. And then I have X transpose times this matrix H, which is a second derivative multiplied with X. This is a type of function, which is resulting from you simply performing a Taylor expansion and truncating the Taylor expansion at the level of the second derivative. Nothing but that. Then when you take the derivative here, what you get, so if I take df and I'm writing df dx because uh, as a partial derivative, because these are now functions which depend on more than one parameter. And I want this to be zero. So that means simply when I take this uh, uh, the derivatives here, I have h times x plus this g transpose and or just g in that case, it just becomes g. And this again, means that I can rewrite X in terms of this matrix H inverse multiplied with G. And keep in mind that G is now evaluated at the term X of N. So we're actually going to rewrite uh, this X now in terms of this variational parameters we have. So this is the optimal value minus the value from a previous iteration. So that means that what we are going to get is something which looks like this, alpha minus alpha of n, which is equal to minus this matrix H minus one, where the matrix elements are evaluated at this specific value. So we are setting up an iterative scheme. And this is multiplied with the gradient, which is evaluated at this value here. So these quantities are known, and we would typically start with a, a either random value or a good guess for the values of alpha, and then we would keep iterating. So what we get then is that the optimal value is given by an iterative scheme, where we now have alpha of n minus this h minus one of alpha of n of g of alpha of n. Now, in our case, H is the second derivative of the energy as a function of one or many variational parameters. So we can leave this in terms of a matrix vector representation, or if we just go down to one variational parameter, we are just going to have a simple equation which involves one unknown quantity. So this uh, gives us then, when we now go back to our case, which were G, of alpha of n is the same as the gradient of the energy with respect to alpha. And this is the expectation value of the energy. And this is now evaluated at this value alpha of n. And similarly, this H is the second derivative of the energy with respect to these parameters alpha. Now, as I said, the first derivative is already a, an ugly expression. So this gradient, del alpha, E of alpha, is actually given by these integrals. So when I write it like this, it means that it's a stochastic evaluation of an integral. So we have the derivative of the log of the wave function, which depends on alpha, derivative respect to alpha, multiplied with the local energy, which is a function of alpha, minus the integral over d ln psi of alpha, multiply with that one. And then we have the final expectation value of the local energy with respect to alpha. So this is the derivative or the gradient of um, the energy with respect to a set of variational parameters. In our case, this just simplifies to one variational parameter for project number one. But when you move to project number two, you will have more than one variational parameter. And that means you need to evaluate a gradient. Does that sound okay? So uh, you'll be surprised that everything actually rotates around us, making this truncation of the Taylor expansion 
at the level of the second derivative, assuming that high order derivatives can be neglected. And then when we do that, it means that we have a mathematical form of the problem we are solving, which looks like this. When we have one parameter, if we have more than one parameter, this uh, turns into a second order equation like this. So that's a starting point. And this is a starting point for all kinds of optimization schemes. So it sounds a little bit disappointing. That's actually a Taylor expansion to where we truncate at second order. So when you take a cause and convex optimization, you will often see uh, the problem being stated in terms of a function which looks like this. So when you then take the derivative of uh, this function with respect to vector x, or just a scalar x, in case you have only one value, then you end up with a standard linear algebra problem. And actually here we should be I have a minus, where you have to invert a matrix and multiply that with a gradient. And that's it. If you can calculate this matrix, clearly you have solved the problem. But normally this matrix involves a second derivative for us of the energy, which again, if you do the calculations, you can rewrite in terms of seven integrals to be evaluated stochastically. And if you have thousand particles in three dimensions, every one of these seven integrals is a say, 10 particles, in, no, thousand particles in three dimensions, every integral is a 3,000 dimensional integral. And you simply don't want to do that, okay? So when you now look at these equations, which you have, this equation, which you see here, this one, this is nothing but Newton's method. And you've probably seen this in many, many courses in mathematics, right? Does anyone who never seen Newton's method? Okay, and this is just based on a uh, perturbative expansion here. So if you now uh, take this expression here and you uh, expand it around a specific value, you can also make some approximations, which uh, would be interesting. So what you could do now, if you look at this term, and let's try just to keep, instead of putting in these complicated expressions for the energy, let's just keep it in just in terms of this equation here, which is a little bit simpler. Note also that I don't put vector and matrix signs on it, but it should be understandable from the context that alpha is now a vector in case you have more than one variational parameter, that this G is a gradient or it's a new vector if you have more than one parameter and that H is a matrix, or alternatively, if you have only one parameter, these are all scalars and then life is much simpler. So let's just keep this uh, at this specific level with the alpha, this is the optimal alpha value minus the H minus one. And now this is multiplied and I'm skipping these dependencies on alphas and so on. So I just write it like G here. So H and G are evaluated at the previous value of the iteration. So what we could do now is simply to replace this H with a constant. And for those of you who have taken a course in machine learning, you know that this is normally called a learning rate. So what you could say now is you could replace that one with a constant minus gamma multiplied with this vector G. So uh, this is actually a method which is in the literature is called the standard gradient descent. And the example which I had in, no, which I had two weeks ago, what I did then was simply to plug in a constant and perform the iteration and find the optimal value of alpha. So if you go back to the, uh, to the codes here, so let me just show you that. So what I implemented uh, two weeks ago, so let's just go back to that. So in this specific code here, I calculate these derivatives of the energy and 
with these derivatives, I'm now setting in an, an iterative process with a parameter eta, which is 0 0.01. So in this specific case, I had two parameters, and then I need to calculate the gradients. Uh, in the example which you have on the whiteboard, I started with just one parameter, but in this case, I have two parameters, and I have one alpha and one beta. And you see now that uh, what I do now is an iteration where I only have 50 iterations. And then I uh, fix a parameter eta equal to 0 0.01. So actually in many of these calculations, it is cheaper to set up different values of alpha. You can set up a grid of alpha values from 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus two, which will be typical values. And then perform the calculations with uh, some few values instead of evaluating the integrals for the second derivative. So the second derivative integrals are prone to statistical errors. You will need many Monte Carlo cycles to get a precise answer. Answer, And that means that you can often replace these uh, evaluations of the integrals with a constant and you set up a grid of values. And then you pick that which gives you the best type of derivatives, which in this case, you want the gradients to be equal to zero. So if you look at this specific example here, if we go back and we run the case here, you will now see that uh, when we run the calculations, it's going, to, uh, it's going to take some time because I use something like 10,000 Monte Carlo cycles to evaluate these integrals. And I have uh, two uh, variational parameters and I do these evaluations for a series of parameters. And you can see now that the iteration here is now when it runs through, uh, this has ended at an energy which should have been free exactly, but it gives us 3.00 something. And you see now that the gradient for this parameter alpha is not exactly equal to zero. And this other parameter is not exactly equal to zero. So we could try and make a, a smaller step size and let's see what happens. So if you have a smaller step size, it means that you move less and that means you need to be closer to the exact value for the minimum. So let's see what happens in that case if I just keep 50 iterations and uh, change this uh, parameter to 10 to the minus three, take some time. And you see now that uh, I actually, this value was too small. So if you go back to the graph, uh, what happened in that specific case, is that I made my step size too small. So let me just bring this down. Oops, sometimes this doesn't disappear, here we go. So if you go back to the graph, which we had, when I make this step size too small, that means that when I start, I start at a given value, so this will be my alpha zero, when I take the derivatives, I'm just moving down here. But since my step size was too small, I actually stopped somewhere here. In the other case, I was actually close to the optimal value for the energy, which is exactly free in that specific case. You also have analytical answers. So then you can get some kind of feeling for how many steps you need in order to find the optimal value. And the interaction which you have is very weak. And since the interaction is very weak, it means that your minimum for the energy as a function of the variational parameters will be pretty close to the value for the harmonic oscillator. So what you actually are calculating is a system with a perturbed harmonic oscillator. So you will actually see that the minimum for the parameter alpha is going to be pretty close to that one, which you had for the non-interacting case. If you make the interaction stronger, you will obviously be further away from the minimum of the plane harmonic oscillator. So that's also a good test of your physics, that things are running correctly. By the way, in the back there, is, is the voice okay? You don't have any problems, huh? Okay, good. So one thing we could do now, if we just look at this equation which we had here, we could perform a new Taylor expansion of the energy uh, around this parameter gamma. So what we could do now is simply to go back to the expression for the energy and plug in this alpha of n minus gamma of this G, which depends 
on alpha of n, like this. And that means that what we would get then would be something like an energy, which depends on alpha of n, and then it has minus gamma times, and now since these are vectors, I'm going to have the inner product of the gradient, and then I have plus one half of uh, gamma squared, and then I have G times transpose, multiplied with this matrix, which contains the second derivatives. And if I truncate this at second order, then this is what we have. But in general, what we have is actually a gamma cubed here. So the optimal gamma is obtained by taking the derivative of that expression with respect to gamma. So if I now take D of E with respect to this variable gamma, the first term which we have is just a constant. I skip the higher order terms. So that means that what I get then is simply a term which goes like G transpose times G. And this contains then, so it has a minus, and then I have plus gamma times G transpose times H times G. And that means that what I get then is that gamma is equal to the inner product of this vector G divided by G multiplied with this matrix, which contains the second derivatives. Now, the reason why I bring this up is that there is another method which is very popular, which is called not gradient descent, but steepest descent. And steepest descent, however, is not used because that actually means that you have to calculate this term here. And again, this term here means that you have to calculate the second derivative of the energy. And we don't want to do that. But one thing you could think of is that uh, if now, if you can calculate this quantity, suppose you can calculate this uh, matrix H, then you uh, see obviously that uh, if this G of H times G is larger than G or G, then this uh, series will not converge because then gamma is going to be larger than one. Then the Taylor expansion doesn't converge. Or we may encounter like, problems with the Taylor expansion. So I'm just gonna wrap up a little bit now and then we take a break. So we may encounter problems with a Taylor expansion. You can also make an assumption now. So if you now assume that these gradients are the eigenvectors of the matrix H. So that means I take H times G is given by an eigenvector, lambda times G here. That is just an assumption we are making. What you will find then is obviously that gamma then simply becomes one divided by lambda. Because what I have then is G transpose times G divided by lambda times G transpose times G. And that simply means that we have one over lambda. And that means that the uh, the uh, size gamma, the one which is going to be the smallest one, is actually going to give be given by the maximum eigenvalue. This is the smallest. And the largest one is one over the smallest eigenvalue. So that is the largest value of gamma. So this is only if you can calculate H. The problem we face is we don't want to calculate H. That's the basic message. And that's why we are going to find ways to circumvent the calculation of H. And that one of the first methods is the gradient descent, where the thing you do then is simply to set up an array of parameters gamma like this, and simply perform the iteration till the gradient disappears or so the simplest approach 
since we don't want to calculate this one, and now we're going to take a small break. Is actually the iterative approach with a set of gammas with various gammas. And you're going to evaluate this equation here. And now I'm just going to put n plus one instead of the optimal value of alpha of n minus gamma multiplied with the gradient of evaluated at alpha of n. And this is a standard gradient descent method. That's the simplest thing you can implement in project one. After the break, we are going to look at something which is called gradient descent with momentum, which uh, normally speeds up the iterative process. And that's something you can think of. And after that, we are going to uh, look at stochastic gradient descent, which for project one is going to be a kind of overkill because your function is gonna be well-defined and you actually don't need to implement a stochastic gradient descent. But if you have more parameters, it may be interesting to implement a stochastic gradient descent. The function which we are going to evaluate is a nice and well-behaved convex function. And as you saw, when we take the harmonic oscillator in one dimension, one particle, two dimensions, three dimensions, and many particles, it's gonna be a nicely well-behaved convex function where the second derivative is always larger than zero. And the first derivative is easier to calculate. So we know the behavior of the function. And that means that since we do that, we have what's normally called a well-behaved optimization problem. This is often the case when you do this kind of quantum mechanical approaches. If you replace the trial wave function with a neural network, then you may not have a, a priori knowledge of the behavior of the, of the function you want to optimize. Any questions? Yeah? In the perfect description, you see that you could either implement the stochastic descent or the stochastic gradient descent. Yeah. In that case, you mean like just the normal gradient yeah, descent? Yeah, normal gradient descent, yeah. Because the steepest, the, the steepest descent, uh, I, I should actually specify that in the project, because the steepest descent means that you have to evaluate and I'm going to derive the equation for the steepest descent for you after the break. The steepest descent means that you need to be able to evaluate a ratio like this. And you don't want to do that, period. So actually, and if somebody, I know that at least three of you have taken a course on machine learning. And in machine learning, this is the basic approach because you don't want to calculate the second derivative, which is a matrix. And that matrix can have a dimensionality of a million times a million. And you simply don't want to invert such a matrix. So what I tried to do now was simply to expose the bottlenecks which we face, the basic approach, which is Taylor expansion. You will always be surprised when you see that, that Taylor expansions actually behind many of the numerical algorithms we deal with. And then with the Taylor expansion, we truncate that at second order. And then we have a, uh, if we have more than one variable, the dimensionality can be two, three or whatever, you end up with a plain linear algebra problem. Okay, let's take a small break. I see you guys need it. So, so one thing I did during the break was simply to change this uh, parameter, which in machine learning is called learning rate. Uh, you can call it whatever you want here. Uh, I change it to 0 0.05, I increase the number of iterations. And now you see that suddenly, so the exact value should be 3.0. And I'm getting to that one uh, at the fifth leading digit. The first derivative which I have of this parameter alpha is 10 to the minus five. And the other one uh, is 10 to the minus three something. So we are getting closer to derivatives which are zero. Uh, 
So you see, this would be actually for project one, this is the simplest possible approach. And actually there's a typo in the project. It's not steepest descent, it's gradient descent. And the, this is the method which we are implementing here. So what I'm going to show you are different variants of doing gradient descent, but I also wanted to say something about steepest descent in case you can calculate the second derivative. And there are other methods like conjugate gradient descent, which are extremely useful when you are having more than just one parameter, because that will follow the gradients and produce orthogonal directions for every iteration. And that leads much at a much faster pace to the uh, local minimum or global minimum. Now, the uh, simple trick which we will do here is to add something which is called momentum or what I like to call memory. So you can weight the different iterations with a parameter and that can normally speed up the convergence of the standard gradient descent method. And then we have uh, other methods like stochastic gradient descent, which become more interesting when you're dealing with large parameter spaces. So that's something which becomes more interesting when you're dealing with uh, project number two, in particular, if you wish to do the uh, uh, calculations with a uh, trial wave function, which is replaced by a neural network. And in that case, you will have many, many more parameters. And then stochastic gradient descent becomes more interesting. But these are things to consider later. For this first project, what I'm showing here now is the simplest possible approach. And in physics and in science in general, there is no reason to overcomplicate things. Okay, so let me go back to the whiteboard here. So what we did here was actually to uh, define the simplest gradient descent method. There is another type of methods, which is called the steepest descent. And that forms the basis for a method like the conjugate gradient descent. But let me just explain to you the steepest descent method. And we are not going to implement that one in project number one, because that requires that you can evaluate this function h or this uh, second derivative. So what I'm going to do now is simply to rewrite that function of x, where x is a vector, it can be a vector, or it can be a scalar. And it should be obvious from the context, whether it's a vector or a scalar. And we would rewrite the problem like this, and I have a matrix H, the second derivative. It doesn't need to be the second derivative. And now instead of having a plus here, I'm just going to put a minus, simply because that gives me a, an equation where I don't have a minus in front of it. So just a, a general uh, rewrite of the function which we had above here. So if you go back, if you look at this function which we had, this one, or the function f of x, which we defined here, this is the starting function. And remember that for our type of problem, this results from a Taylor expansion where you truncate the Taylor expansion at the level of the second derivative. That's how we get that equation. And it's expanded around the optimal value. So in the steepest descent, we have this function. So if I take the derivative of the F with respect to X, this is now being a vector in this case, then this is nothing that H times x minus b equal to zero. And that gives us a famous linear algebra problem. H is a matrix. And you've probably seen this problem before. B is known, x is the unknown quantity, and h is known, okay? And we know that if you can invert a matrix, you would typically solve it. But normally you never do that because matrix inversion is more expensive numerically. You would typically solve this with uh, something like uh, uh, an LU decomposition, lower upper decomposition, if you have many such equations to solve. And if the matrix H stays the same, 
And then you can have many other methods in case the matrix is a tridiagonal matrix. Then you have something which is called a Thomas algorithm, where, which actually has a very few number of floating point operations compared to standard lower upper decomposition, which again is just a variant of Gaussian elimination. In our case, uh, since H is going to be a uh, positive definite matrix, because it's related to the second derivative of the energy. So the matrix is actually going to be positive definite. And the standard approach is actually to solve these type of problems in an iterative way. And if the matrix H is positive definite, what you can actually show, you can prove that, is that you can start with a random initial choice for X and it will always, always converge to the exact value. So that's only if the matrix is a positive definite matrix, which means that all eigenvalues are larger than zero. So that's just a small digression here. So what is common now when you define, when you develop this method is to define something which you call the residual. So that would be the arrow which you make. So we can define that as R, which is equal to B minus A, now H times X. So in case you have a guess for X, this is actually the error you make with that specific guess. So a typical, uh, when you have the solution, when you have the X at X, then R is equal to zero, because that means that we have solved this equation here, right? So you normally start with a guess for X zero. It could be a random choice. You could even put it to zero, which is also a common choice. So you start with an initial guess, X zero, and then what you have then, is obviously R zero is going to be equal to minus H times X zero plus this B. And if you put X zero equal to zero, then R zero is equal to B. And this is a standard approach which is normally used. And some of you may have encountered methods like uh, uh, the uh, Jordan method, Gauss-Jordan, Gauss-Seidel, and other type of iterative methods, which are widely used. This is just another variant of uh, what comes in here. So in general, what you have, you have an R of K plus one of B minus H times X of K plus one. So we are making a further assumption. And an assumption is that this X of K plus one is given by the previous value X of K plus some parameter alpha of K multiplied with this residual. So this residual enters the definition of our X of K. So in case uh, R of K is zero, then X of K is equal to X of K plus one and everything has converged. So if you have the exact solution, then R of K is equal to zero. The other thing you make as an assumption is also that these Rs are orthogonal to each other. But let's go back. So if I use this, I can actually rewrite R of K plus one as a B minus H. And then I have X of K plus alpha times R of K here. And I can rewrite this one as a B minus H of X of K. And then I have minus, and then I have alpha of K times H of R of K. And if you look at what you have here, this term, which is in here, this is nothing but this R of K. 
So we have then an R of K plus one is equal to R of K minus this alpha of K multiplied with this matrix times this R of K here. And then uh, what we want is R of K plus one equal to zero because then it has converged, right? So that means that what we get is actually an R of K, which is equal to an alpha of K of H times R of K. So what I'm gonna do next now, since these are vectors and I want the scalar alpha, what I'm going to do now is to multiply with R of K transpose on both sides. So remember now that alpha of K is just a constant, it's a scalar. So that means that uh, what I do now is I multiply with the uh, R of K transpose from both sides. So what I get then is R of K transpose times R of K divided by R of K transpose times this H R of K, and that gives us alpha of K. And then I have this constant alpha of K. And that tells us how X is changing per iteration. So if you think of this as your, uh, your kind of learning rate, so if you go back to the equations which we had, so we had a D of F of X of D of X, which we want to be equal to zero. This is the same as this H of X minus this quantity B. And this is again, uh, something which we are going to interpret in terms of the gradient. So if you look at what we had in the previous equation here, so clearly we want this to be zero, but this one is simply going to mean that this X of K plus one, when you look at this equation, which we have here, this one, this is nothing but this residual, which we had, if we think in terms of the iteration. So this is going to be minus alpha of the, uh, and then you can think of this term, which you have here. This is nothing but your gradient. So this is gonna be an alpha of K multiplied with the gradient, which we have. So this G of X of K here. So that brings us back to the, uh, to, uh, uh, the approach which we had previously, except that now with the steepest descent here, what you have is a recipe to find this parameter alpha of K Whereas when we did the standard steepest descent, we or gradient descent, we just had a parameter alpha, which we need to tune. With the steepest descent, you have a recipe to find this alpha of K or gamma of K, but that involves the calculation of the second derivative. And again, we don't want to do that. So the steepest descent is a very nice method, but we don't want to evaluate the second derivative. Now, there are methods like quasi-Newton methods, which allow you to approximate the second derivative. Uh, we will mention that most likely a little bit more next week. Now, I just wanted to give you the main overview. And those methods, uh, except for the simpler cases, like the ones we have in project one, become less practical because they try to approximate the matrix H and if you have thousands of parameters, you simply don't want to invert a matrix, which is which has a dimensionality thousand times thousand. So for the simpler case, which we have, uh, such a method like this uh, Broyden's method, which it computes in approximative way, the gradient, and no, not the gradient, but the Hessian matrix, or this matrix H, that is a method which one can think of using when you have few parameters. And there is, if we go back to the code from last week, so let me just bring that up again. There is an example, and I'm going to go through more the details of the Broyden's method next time. This method here uh, is often shortened to Broyden, Fletcher, I think it's Goldhaber and Shannon for the S. And uh, this is something which will be included in scientific Python, but I've also provided C++ functions for those of you who prefer to write in C++, which implement Broyden's method. Uh, 
So this is a quasi-Newton method in the sense that it tries to estimate the second derivative and then tries to approximate that one by extrapolations as you move on in your gradient descent uh, approach. And in this particular case, uh, what I've done is simply to run the calculations. So I have the derivatives and I need to provide to the function who, as it is implemented in uh, scientific Python, you need to use this function minimize. You need to provide a function for the energy. You need an initial guess for the parameters. You need to plug in the method. And then you have to have a function for the energy derivative. And then you have a tolerance for your iterative process, which means uh, how small the gradient should be. And so if you run this one, what you will see then is that the, it will converge pretty fast compared to the previous case. So it had a divide by zero here. Okay. Okay, so it did a calculation. So it, the uh, value which it gets for these parameters, so these are the optimal parameters. So it did four iterations. So these are the parameters alpha, which uh, is 0.96. And then you have the other parameter. And then you can use these to calculate the uh, expectation value of the energy with many more Monte Carlo cycles. In this case, I'm calculating the integrals with 10,000 Monte Carlo cycles, which obviously is not a uh, big calculation for this specific case. But the whole idea is that you want to use as few cycles as possible in order to find the optimal parameters here. So this is also something you can think of using for these small cases. So I'm going to say a little bit more about Broyden's method a little bit later. Now, there are ways by which we can speed up the standard gradient descent, and that's called gradient descent with momentum. So let's uh, go back to the whiteboard and say something about that, and then we go back and look at the codes. So you saw from the code which I had that the gradient descent was pretty slow, but we can actually speed up that one. So speed up. GD, so GD for gradient descent. And that is normally called gradient descent with momentum. I always claim that this momentum is a wrong name for it, but it has its root in uh, studies of Newton's equation of motion. But actually what you're doing now is that you're trying to weight the iterative process with information from previous iterations. So if you look at the standard gradient descent, if you go back a little bit, if you look at this approach here, what we are doing now is that we are using the gradient calculated at the value alpha of n in order to predict a new alpha of n value. So one thing you can do now is instead of just using this gradient, you could now use a gradient in addition to that one. You could weight it with a gradient which depends on alpha of n minus one. So previous step. Because sometimes your gradient may vary a lot when you're getting close to, let's say, a minimum. And that means that if you now pick a value from the previous iteration, when you then weight that in, that can dampen fluctuations in the calculations of the gradient. Because when you're getting close to the minimum, the gradient can jump a little bit back and forth, depending how the function varies. And this is normally something which speeds up the calculations of the gradient descent. And when we run the calculations, we are always looking after ways to speed up the calculations. So let me give you some of the basics of, uh, or the motivation for the name momentum gradient descent. And everything resides in uh, studies of Newton's equations. So if you now take Newton's equation here, so this is the historical background for this specific method. So DT, everybody has seen that one. So you have some kind of friction term 
or drag term. There is no driving force here. And this is equal to uh, a uh, force which is acting on the system. And we know that the force is actually the gradient of the potential. So now we're assuming that we have a, a force which only depends on the positions. So this is actually your force, right? So the, the force is the negative gradient of the potential. I guess that rings a bell back from classical mechanics. So what you would do now when you discretize the second derivative and the first derivative, so this is just a rewrite of these quantities, second and first derivative. What you get then is that the second derivative, the acceleration in our case, is something you can approximate with the acceleration evaluated at a t plus delta t plus x of t minus delta t minus two times x of t. And for those of you taking computational physics one, you may have seen this expression before. So this is a standard way you approximate the second derivative with finite differences. And then you have the first derivative. You simply replace that one with the Euler's formula. So this would be an X of T plus Delta T minus X of T divided by Delta T here. So they are again, since we talked about Taylor expansions in the previous lecture, they are all based on manipulations of Taylor expansions, nothing but that. Then we can rewrite uh, the equations. So I'm going to use a shorthand here, T plus Delta T and minus is going to be X of T plus minus Delta T. And it means that X of T is just X of T. Just as a shorthand. So if I plug this in to the equation I had, I'm going to get X of T plus Delta T plus X of T minus Delta T minus two times X of T divided by delta t squared plus this constant mu. And then I have x of t plus delta t minus x of t divided by delta t. And this is equal to this uh, gradient. So I'm keeping this gradient expression because I want to make this link with gradient descent. That's why I keep the force in that specific form. So this is historically why uh, this is called uh, gradient descent with the momentum. So what I do now is I define a parameter delta of X of T plus delta T, which is just X of T plus delta T minus X of T. And then I have a delta X of T, which is simply X of T minus X of T plus Delta T. So this is X of T minus here, sorry. This X of T minus Delta T is going to be my value from the previous iteration, which I now want to keep track of. So if I plug everything in uh, to the equation, which I had, I get that X, Delta X plus Delta T. So if you look at these equations here, this one, I can go back to the equations and you see I have one term here and I also have one term here and one from here. So I can rewrite my equation now and you will see that this can be rewritten in terms of minus delta T squared divided by M plus this parameter mu times delta T. And this is multiplied with delta V of X plus this M of M plus mu of delta T multiplied with delta X of T. And then I'm going to replace uh, this term here with a new variable, which I just called delta. And finally, I'm gonna put in a new constant gamma. So I'm gonna 
label these constants here as a gamma. So then I can rewrite this delta x of t plus delta t, which is my new value in terms of minus gamma times the gradient v of x plus this parameter delta, which now keeps track of the value at the time t minus delta t. So remember now that this delta x has no information about the previous iteration here. So this is the typical way by which you now can bake in information about the previous iteration. Uh, this result here is your new one, right? This plays the same role as your learning rate or that parameter gamma, which we had. This is a gradient of the function you're looking after. So if you now look carefully at what you have here, this is something which I can rewrite as an x of t plus delta t, the new value, equal to the old value. So it gets a plus here, because you see the definition here, it has a minus x of t, minus gamma of delta v of x. And if you think of the, the gradient descent method, this would be my alpha of n plus one. This is my old value, alpha of n. And then I have minus gamma, and then I have the gradient calculated at alpha of n, okay? That's the way you can think of it. And then what you see now is that I am, I am waiting the result with the result that is x of t and the previous result. So it means I keep track of a memory of what happened before. So if you now want to make the comparison here, what is pretty common to do is then to define to, or rather to let this x of t become this alpha of n and this x of t plus delta t becomes our alpha at n plus one. Our gradient dv of x is now replaced by the gradient evaluated at the value alpha of n. And then I can actually rewrite my variable of alpha of n plus one as an alpha of n minus this parameter gamma multiplied with g or evaluated alpha of n plus some parameter delta, which is given by my value of alpha of n minus my value at an n minus one stage. So that means that uh, you can think of uh, delta. So delta can be interpreted as a kind of memory parameter. as a memory parameter, where we are just plugging in a variable delta, which now will take values between zero and one. And then you wait your iterative process with information from the previous iteration. So I, I like to call this as a memory parameter. So the algorithm is actually you rewriting everything in terms of uh, uh, information where you keep information from the previous value. And then you need to define a parameter delta, which weights the new value and the old values. So alpha or rather delta, as we call it here, becomes a parameter where you typically would put values between zero and one, depending on how much you want to weight the previous iteration. So the name momentum arises from this rewrite of Newton's uh, uh, standard equation of motion. But many people just introduce a parameter, an ad hoc parameter, where you simply multiply the previous result with a parameter. And that is because when the gradients vary a lot, you can actually dampen the, the big variations by keeping information of previous steps. So what I'm going to do now is to go back to the slides. <clears throat> 
and look at the uh, uh, slides for this week because there's an example on how you can implement this uh, gradient descent with momentum. And that is a simple trick which allows you to speed up the gradient descent method. And you will often see that it halves the number of iterations you need in order to reach a minimum. So gradient descent with momentum is the second cheapest way by which you can uh, implement the search for the minimum before you start the large scale Monte Carlo calculation. So let's take a look at that. And then we can take a small break here. So if we now go to the slides for this week, uh, it should be here. So what you will see in the beginning is uh, a lot of the same material, which I covered on the whiteboard. I prefer to go through things on the whiteboard. I hope you don't mind, because that slows down the pace a little bit and it's a little bit boring if you just read from slides. So I like to run the codes in the Jupyter notebooks, but then I prefer to do the derivations on the whiteboard. I, I hope that's okay. So my whiteboard is actually um, a kind of more modern variant of a, of a blackboard. So here's just a reminder about uh, convex functions, uh, steepest descent, graduate conjugate gradient methods, etc. But we're going to uh, to skip that. Uh, you can actually read uh, some of this, uh, but let me now, uh, and there are some gradient descent examples, but let me now uh, look at the way we do momentum. And there is a simple function here, an x squared, and I calculated the derivative, which so I want the minimum of x squared. I have the derivative, which is, I hope you don't get offended if I show you simple functions like this. And then I calculate the gradient in this specific case. And now what I'm doing, I have a parameter, which I call my step size, which is 0.1, which is this parameter, uh, which I call delta in the, in, in the notes. So I actually calculate the gradients. So that's the derivative, which I have in this case. And I uh, compute my gradient uh, by multiplying with the step size. This is a standard gradient descent. There is no momentum here. And you will typically see for this function with gradient descent, plain gradient descent, I need something close to 30 iterations to find a gradient which is, it basically gives me a function which is zero. So the function should be zero here. And what I've indicated here is all the evaluations which I need to get to zero, which is this value here. Then the next function contains gradient descent. Uh, with momentum, the same function, nothing exciting. But in this case here, I have a, my step size times the gradient, but now I have momentum times change. So mm -hmm. I want actually to keep this information. So I do the solution, which is solution minus the new change. And then I put the change equal to the new change. So when I iterate here, I get in the next iteration, I get the previous result added to it. So you see now change is equal to new change. So that will be multiplied in here instead of just having step size times gradient. And if you look at the runs here, in this particular case for the same function, you see now that when I have performed roughly 13 iterations instead of 30, this is basically zero. So if you look at my gradient, which I have, so my gradient is actually in, no, so this is the gradient and this is the function value, 10 to the minus seven should be zero. And uh, in, no, sorry, this is the X value. So you have the minimum at X zero. That's where you have the minimum. And you see here that the value is as much, much closer to zero after 30 iterations. And if I look at the result here, you will see that it is not equal to zero. So here I need, uh, 30 iterations to reach that accuracy. Whereas here, I'm actually at the same quality of results at 12, 13 mm -hmm. iterations. So I basically more than doubled the, uh, how to say the efficiency of the code with just this simple modification where I keep track of the value 
of the iterative parameter at an earlier, at a previous stage. And that's normally called a gradient descent with momentum. Uh, as I said, I like to call it memory because you keep track of a previous value. This is a pretty common trick. If somebody has done Hartley Fock calculation or density functional theory calculations, this is also an iterative process. And it's common to weight the previous iterations with a constant. And in this case here, we just weighted it with uh, 0.3. So people have often introduced this in a very ad hoc way in many of these iterative schemes. So I would normally recommend in project one to implement either just plain gradient descent. And when you do the plain gradient descent, you would need to have a convergence criteria. So let's do that before we take a small break. So the, the typical convergence criterion you would set up would be something like this. So let me just take that one down, oops. No, didn't it? Oops, maybe it's time to take a break here. Huh? Here we are. So the typical convergence criterion you would set up So you would fix the number of iterations, fix max iterations. And you would stop the iterative process when uh, stop if reached max iterations. And then it may not have converged. So you need an additional test iteration or stop when, and if you have vectors, you need to calculate the uh, absolute values of the vectors. That will be the norm two here. When this quantity is smaller or equal to some predefined quantity by u. So you could put this one to 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five or whatever. And if you reach that value, uh, after a given number of iterations, you will stop. Or clearly, if this hasn't been reached, you would stop after a given number of max iterations. But then it may not have been, may not have converged. So typically what you would do then, if you want to obey this condition here, you would simply say that if it, this condition hasn't been met, you should increase the number of iterations. Many people just put it converged if max iterations or the other test kicks in. Not both. Okay, should we take a small break, guys? Let's do that thing. Eh? Minutes. So for project number one, we uh, can obtain pretty okay result with just plain gradient descent. And we can speed up the plain gradient descent by using momentum. And you will find examples in the uh, Jupyter notebooks on how you can use it. So what I wanted to point to you uh, are specific uh, additional applications which we can uh, which we can do. So the uh, the type of additional applications, if you wish to, is to implement what's called stochastic gradient descent. So stochastic gradient descent is widely used in machine learning algorithms. And uh, the uh, point with stochastic gradient descent is that you don't know whether you have a function which is well behaved with a global minimum. Uh, you have a multidimensional space, which also means that the evaluation of the gradient becomes expensive. Now, in our case, we have one parameter or perhaps some few more which means that from that point of view, you are just calculating the gradient of one or few other parameters. The calculation of bottleneck in project one is the stochastic evaluation of the gradients. That's where you are going to spend most of the cycles. The uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent becomes handy when you have a multidimensional object you want to optimize. This is not the case in project one. 
And that's why I would normally, rec I normally recommend using standard gradient descent, where you replace the calculation of a second derivative with a constant. And then if you add momentum, you can speed up the iterative process. Now, stochastic gradient descent is one, a way to sample a multidimensional variable space and find a minimum and avoid, it promises to avoid to be stuck in local minima. And secondly, uh, you split the evaluation of the gradient, which is normally given by some matrix times a vector or an evaluation of a multivariable vector. You split that one in smaller batches, as they're called, and the smaller batches require less floating point operations. So stochastic gradient descent, uh, the way many of you have seen it uh, and applied to machine learning algorithms often involves matrix vector multiplications. In our case, it's just gonna be a gradient, a plain gradient. And uh, for our specific application in project one is just a variable, which is a scalar. So there's no vector in our case. But stochastic gradient descent then means that you typically replace the evaluation of the gradient, which now has some contributions from different terms. So this could be the data points you have. So this is more tailored to uh, cases where you have a huge data set where you want to optimize that. And you would split the evaluation of the gradient in a smaller uh, so-called batches, where you would typically, if you have a data set which now contains, let's say, 10 points, as a, as an example here, you would then split this in something which is called mini batches. And these batches would then contain two data points each. And then you would typically evaluate the gradient for each of these data points. And if your object becomes more complicated, this means that you are actually spending fewer floating point operations. So the idea then is to actually approximate the gradient by replacing the sum of all the data points you have with the sum of the data points in one of the mini batches, picked at random in each gradient descent step. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is that for some of you, it may be of interest to solve project two using the same model or the same Hamiltonian as we have here but replace the trial wave function with a neural network. Mm -hmm. So that's when the stochastic gradient descent becomes more interesting. So for project one, as I said, I mean, uh, there's no need to overcomplicate life, but you could try to implement a stochastic gradient descent if you wish to for project number one here. So, and the, uh, uh, the gradient step then, as you can see here, you would then have a defined a number of uh, data points, which you have in the data set. You have a size of batches. You calculate the number of mini batches, and then you pick randomly the uh, mini batch. The whole idea there is also to avoid being stuck in a local minimum by picking randomly the positions at different uh, places in your data set. And that can normally avoid you being stuck in a local minimum. Again, the specificity of project one is that you have a simple convex function with just one global minimum. So in a certain sense, this recipe, which is used in the stochastic gradient descent, which tries to avoid you being stuck in a local minimum is something which we don't need to think of here. So I'm just mentioning the methods here because the, they can be of interest for the next type of project or if you have many parameters to optimize. So uh, I'm not going to go through all the details here because this becomes more interesting for those of you who want to work with uh, Project 2 and neural networks. So I'm just gonna skip that here. Uh, the thing which I wanted to mention, if you look at the slides here, uh, there is much more information which is more tailored to that variant two of the project. Uh, and there are ways to uh, obtain an iterative uh, update of this parameter gamma, which we define. And these are methods uh, which are more common in the machine learning. And these are methods which allow you to adaptively change this learning rate parameter. What I would recommend in project one is that you simply try 
different value of this learning parameter, this parameter we put in front of the gradient, and then just play around with that and find the optimal values. And when you have the optimal values for the parameters, you start the big Monte Carlo calculation. This is the easiest approach. And that's the one which works best for project one. But if you feel tempted to use stochastic gradient descent, please do that. But I mean, it's a, it's a, I would say it's a kind of overkill for project one because we have only one variational parameter. But one thing which you could think of is actually when you look at the, uh, uh, so we, you, this is a tool, I don't know how familiar you are with automatic differentiation. So I know that some of you have been using it, at least three of you here. So who has never heard of automatic differentiation? Okay, so that's a uh, fantastic algorithm, which allows you to calculate derivatives to numerical precision. But it assumes that you have analytical expressions for the quantities you want to calculate the derivative. So one thing which uh, automatic differentiation could be very useful for is to calculate the derivatives of the wave functions which you have, the trial wave functions. So automatic differentiation uses explicitly the chain rule and properties of functions like exponentials, cosine, sine, square roots, well-known functions to actually be able to calculate derivatives to numerical precision. So like if you look at the second derivative of the energy, not of the wave function, which is needed for the kinetic energy, you could actually use automatic differentiation for that. Or if you look at the quantum force, you could also do that. For this specific project, the functions we are dealing with are pretty simple. So it's just e to the minus alpha squared times x squared. And it's easy to calculate analytically the derivatives and put it back into the program. Like those programs examples, which you saw in the previous week, like here, if you look at the, the wave functions, which we have, it's uh, uh, simply an exponential here. And it's easy to calculate the derivative of the wave function answer. So I, I actually hard coded these der derivatives here. And there is no need to use automatic differentiation. But when your wave function becomes more complicated, it's actually boring to calculate derivatives again and again, uh, especially if you want to test, let's say 10 trial wave functions, and they all vary by some uh, X dependence. And, and if I had given you as an exercise in project one to calculate uh, the energy, for 10 trial wave functions, you would have hated me. These are things which you can actually use automatic differentiation to calculate these expressions. So this gives you much more flexibility to actually study different physics cases. I mean, there is no insight in calculating new derivatives. If you can calculate the derivatives, you know how to calculate it. So if somebody's interested, I could say a little bit more about automatic differentiation. But for us, uh, we can just think of that as a useful tool to calculate derivatives to numerical position. And it works much better than the finite difference schemes. You can actually try that as an example at, at the third derivative of e to the x. Even that simple function, it fails with the finite difference formula. And if you use automatic differentiation, you will have the value to numerical position. Also, don't use symbolic Python or Mathematica to calculate derivatives because they will give you an analytical expressions if you can get an analytical expression. And it allows you also to translate everything into C++ or Python or Fortran codes. So you have a print statement if you use SymPy. The problem is that the equations are never written with respect to numerical efficiency. So it will often involve many floating point operations, many more than uh, you would be able to waste. So, and uh, you can actually show with automatic differentiation that you can really reduce the number of floating point operations considerably when you calculate derivatives. So this is something, and I have uh, in the slides, you will find uh, several examples on how to use automatic differentiation. 
So this is not something which um, is a must in project number, in this project, uh, but you could think of it and take a look at it. And if you're interested, we could discuss this in the lab sessions. So this is just an additional computational tool, uh, which is extremely handy, in particular since we normally have analytical expressions for the wave functions, which we want to evaluate. So I'm gonna stop the lecture part here now, and uh, I hope the uh, kind of gradient descent overview has been enough for you to get started. And if you go back to the slides from week uh, five, from two weeks ago, you will find examples on how to build up the uh, expressions for, for the derivative of the energy with respect to the variation parameters. And as I said, in our case, you have just one parameter and that is much easier. And then you can go back. And if you look at the one dimensional case, you know what the answer should be for one particle. For two particles, it's just this number here multiplied by two, 10 particles multiplied by 10. So that's pretty easy. So that means that you have simple tests you can benchmark your code against. Something which is unclear, too much information. I'm trying to guide you when it comes to what you should do and what is the most efficient tool. Okay, I'm gonna stop the recording here. And then I just suggest that we uh, start looking at the project and you guys should, Irvin is also going to come. So we, we can just discuss strategies and everything related to the project, if that is okay. Okay, so let me just...